Today I'm going to talk to you about marriage. In fact, I'm going to begin with a very frank and personal question. Do you have a successful marriage, one that brings you real happiness and satisfaction? Or if you're not married yourself, how about your friends? How many couples do you know who have the kind of marriage that you yourself would wish to have if you were married? I remember once talking with a young man who'd come to me for help with his marriage. He was a minister in a large and well-known denomination. His experience in the ministry had left him sadly disillusioned. He said to me, Brother Prince, I know about 40 couples pretty well. Several of them are in the ministry like me. But to tell you the truth, I can't think of one couple that is really happy. Would you call that cynical or just realistic? I want to share with you today that it is really possible to have a successful marriage. There is a key to such a marriage. I know because I've found it. First, let me give you a little of my own personal background my qualifications, if you like. I want you to understand that what I have to say is based on experience, not merely on theory. It sometimes grieves me when I hear a so-called expert on marriage or home or the family holding forth in long psychological phrases and jargon, and yet when you examine their own lives, in many cases they themselves are the product of broken homes, and often they have at least one unsuccessful marriage in their own past. Personally, I can't listen to an expert like that because if a person doesn't make it work in his own life, I don't see how he's capable of counseling or advising or helping others. In my case, I want you to know that what I'm saying is not based primarily on university degrees or ordination papers. It so happens I have both. I have degrees from Cambridge University in Britain, and I hold ordination papers. But the basis in which I'm speaking to you today is experience. My first marriage with Lydia lasted almost exactly 30 years. It was ended by her death in 1975, during our time together, we raised a family of nine daughters, so I know a little about raising children. We went through many hard experiences. We were in the middle of a war, the war that brought the state of Israel to birth. We faced siege and famine and danger. We moved from country to country and continent to continent. We worked in Africa, in Canada, in Europe, and in the United States. But our marriage was firm, happy, successful. I want you to understand that the success of a marriage does not depend on lack of tensions or problems, but it depends on establishing a relationship which can stand and overcome those tensions and problems. I don't believe most marriages are easy in the accepted sense. You will say, well, where did you find the key? to this kind of a marriage? My answer is very simple, in the Bible. I want you to know that I believe that the Bible is a true, relevant, up-to-date book. I believe it has the answers to life's problems today. I believe all we need to do is apply it, and it works. The Bible attaches great importance to marriage. Much more, I think, than most churchgoers or Christians realize. According to the Bible, human history started with a marriage. God created Adam, and then he said it was not good for him to be alone. And he himself formed and brought to him a wife, a helpmeet. Marriage initiated in the heart of God, not in the thought of man. And I believe once we get away from God's concept of marriage, it's not going to work. Furthermore, the Bible ends with a marriage. The great climax of all human history is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what all history is leading up to. 
So I think you'll agree with me when I say that if you view the Bible objectively, it places tremendous importance on marriage. Marriage was conceived in the Bible. It was conceived in the heart of God. And there, too, we find the key to a successful marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul has been speaking about marriage. He's been comparing the relationship of Jesus Christ to his church to that of a bridegroom to his bride. He concludes this comparison with this statement. This is a great mystery. One of the modern translations says a profound mystery. He's speaking about marriage. Now we need to understand that in the language of the New Testament, the word mystery had a specific meaning. It meant a secret that most people didn't know, but that could be learned if you went through a process of initiation and got in with the right group. And so that's what marriage is. It's a secret that most people don't know, but it can be learned if you go through the process of initiation. And that's what I'm going to try to help you to do in my talk today and the rest of this week. Now, to come to this secret that's the key to a successful marriage, I want to turn to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. At this time, Israel as a nation were not very close to God. God had given them his law, but in most cases they'd been somewhat disobedient. And as a result, they were not enjoying the blessings that God had promised them. They had a lot of problems, and some of their problems were like the problems of many people today. They were in their homes and in their marriages. And God puts his finger on the reason for their problems. And I'm going to read to you Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. You understand they were religious people. They were doing a lot of praying, but God wasn't answering their prayers. And they say, for what reason? And then the Lord gives them this answer. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. I want you to notice three points about that. First of all, religion does not necessarily produce successful marriages. These people were very religious. They were praying all the time. They were in the temple but their homes were in a mess. Do you know that that's true of many situations today? A lot of religious people who go a lot to church and quote the Bible and talk religious language do not have happy homes. So bear that in mind, first of all. Religion does not necessarily produce a happy home. Then the second point I want to bring to your notice is that a wrong relationship between husband and wife hinders our relationship with God. God said he wouldn't hear their prayers, and they said, why? And he said to them, because you haven't dealt right with your wife. You've been unfaithful to the wife of your covenant. And the other scriptures tell us the same. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter instructs husbands to be careful how they live with their wives so that their prayers will not be hindered. In other words, if you pray out of an unhappy marriage and it is ordered home, your prayers may not be very effective. God says, get your home in order. Then the third point I want to bring to you is the vital one. It's the key. It's the last word of that scripture, the word covenant. This is the key to a successful marriage. It's the realization out of scripture that marriage is a covenant. Covenant is one of the key concepts of the Bible. The same word that's translated covenant is also translated testament. And so you see that the whole Bible comes to us in the form of two covenants or two testaments. I think that shows the importance that God attaches to a covenant that his whole word to us, his written word, comes in the form of a covenant. Now, there are two essential features to a covenant that affect marriage, and I'm going to mention them. The first is a covenant demands commitment, total, unreserved, wholehearted commitment. And that's part of marriage. Marriage is not an experimental relationship. 
It's not a trial. It can only succeed on the basis of total commitment. Secondly, in a covenant, God sets the terms for a commitment. Man does not set the terms. God sets the terms. This was the problem with Israel in the days of Malachi. They were trying to set their terms for how marriage should be. And God said, I won't accept that. So I want you to hold on to these two important points. First of all, that marriage begins with a commitment. Secondly, that God sets the terms. Yesterday I spoke about the key to a successful marriage. The Bible's revelation that marriage is a covenant. Basically this means two things. First of all it means commitment. There is no covenant without a commitment. Marriage is not an experiment. It begins with a commitment. Those who bypass commitment cannot find God's purpose for marriage. Secondly, in a covenant God sets the terms. He does not leave it to man to decide on what basis that a marriage will be ordered, but he has laid down certain specific, simple terms. So today I'm going to go on with this theme and explain to you in a practical way just how the understanding of covenant can make all the difference between success and failure in marriage, and in your marriage particularly. The words covenant and testament are very important in the whole revelation of the Bible. Actually, the Bible comes to us in the form of two testaments, the Old Testament and the New. The same word that's translated testament in many other places is translated covenant. So we always need to bear in mind that a testament is a covenant and a covenant is a testament. The English translation sometimes obscures that fact for some Bible readers. Now, the next fact about a covenant is that in the Bible it always required a sacrifice. A covenant could not be made without a sacrifice. And a sacrifice meant the taking of a life, the laying down of a life. In the Old Testament, there was a rather strange method by which people entered into covenant with one another. They would take the sacrificial animals, whatever they might be, they would slay them, cut them in two halves, lay the two halves opposite one another, and then walk together through the two halves of the slain animals. There's a very interesting example of this in Genesis chapter 15, where the Lord himself, in this way, made a covenant with Abraham. Later on this week, I'm going to speak more fully about that, but just lay hold of this fact for the time being, that a covenant is based on a sacrifice and entering into a covenant is passing with the people whom you are making covenant with through the sacrifice. In other words, the way into covenant is through a life laid down. That's what the sacrifice represents. Now, you might think that this is simply true in the Old Testament, but that's not so. Because in the epistle to the Hebrews, in the ninth chapter, verses 16 and 17, the writer reinforces this in the New Testament. This is what he says. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Now that's a very, I would say, a startling statement. A covenant is only operative, it's only valid, when the one who makes the covenant is dead. Now, for us as Christians, the great and final sacrifice is the death of Jesus. There are many passages of the New Testament that speak about this. For instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. In other words, the sacrifice on which the new covenant is based is the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And his death, when we accept it by faith, becomes our death. 
One died for all, therefore all were dead. Christ did not die actually for himself. He died for us. He died as our representative. His death becomes our death. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you see, the essential teaching about the death of Jesus Christ is that it was the last and final sacrifice for sin, and that his death was substitutionary, that he died for us. And so we enter into the new covenant, not through the two halves of a slain animal, but through the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. But the covenant is only valid if we accept his death as our death. A covenant is not yet valid as long as the one who makes it live. Jesus died to make the covenant with us. But the covenant only becomes effective in our lives when we reckon ourselves to be dead with him. His death becomes our death. He is the sacrifice through whom we pass into the new covenant. How does this principle of covenant apply particularly to marriage? We've said that a covenant is valid only when the one who makes the covenant has died. So if marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, how does that apply? Well, the great basic principle is that the covenant of marriage for Christians is based on the death of Jesus. His death was our death. It's through him we enter into this covenant. And this applies specifically to the covenant of marriage. Now, I've explained this just as clearly as I'm able in my book, The Marriage Covenant. And so I'm going to read a few paragraphs from that book because it says what I want to say just as clearly as I'm able to say it. So I'm reading now from my book, The Marriage Covenant. The sacrifice upon which the covenant of Christian marriage is based is the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. He is the sacrifice through which, by faith, a man and a woman can pass into the relationship of marriage as God himself ordained that it should be. Just as the Lord and Abraham pass between the pieces of the slain animals, so in marriage a man and woman pass through the death of Jesus Christ on their behalf into a totally new life and a totally new relationship, which would have been impossible without the death of Jesus Christ. The covenant of Christian marriage is made at the foot of the cross. There are three successive phases in the outworking of this relationship. First, a life is laid down. Each lays down his life for the other. The husband looks back at Christ's death on the cross and says, That death was my death. When I came through the cross, I died. Now I am no longer living for myself. The wife likewise looks at the cross and says the same. That death was my death. When I came through the cross, I died. Now I am no longer living for myself. Henceforth, each holds nothing back from the other. Everything the husband has is for the wife. Everything the wife has is for the husband. No reservations, nothing held back. It is a merger, not a partnership. Second, out of that death comes a new life. Each now lives out that new life in and through the other. The husband says to the wife, My life is in you. I am living out my life through you. You are the expression of what I am. Likewise, the wife says to the husband, My life is in you. I am living out my life through you. You are the expression of what I am. Third, the covenant is consummated by physical union. And this in turn brings forth fruit which continues the new life that each has been willing to share with the other. In the whole realm of living creatures, God has ordained this basic principle. Without union, there can be no fruit. Covenant leads to shared life and fruitfulness. Life that is not shared remains sterile and fruitless. This approach to marriage, which sees it in terms of a covenant, is very different from the attitude with which most people today enter into marriage. Basically, the attitude of our contemporary culture is, what can I get? What is there in this for me? 
I believe that any relationship approached with this attitude is doomed to end in failure. The one who approaches the marriage as a covenant does not ask, what can I get? Rather, he asks, what can I give? And he goes on to ask, answer his own question. I give my life. I lay it down for you, and then I find my new life in you. This applies equally to each party, to the husband and to the wife. To the natural mind, this sounds ridiculous. Yet it is, in fact, the secret of real life, real happiness, and real love. So much for my reading from my book, The Marriage Covenant. Let me just take a moment or two to wrap that up for you before I close. There's a life to lose and a life to find. As long as you enter into marriage holding on to your own life, you will not find the life that God has for you in that covenant. It's a step of faith. You've got to lay down your life in faith and find a new life, a life that's different, a life that comes in union, a life that you cannot have on your own. Each party to the marriage has to make that step of faith. The key word again is commitment. It's not an experiment. You have to make a commitment. And the key fact is this, that the commitment releases God's grace. Without God's grace, marriage will never work. But God does not release his grace into a marriage until both parties have made that commitment. And out of God's grace come the resources needed to make the marriage to work. Now, I've got to close for today, but I'll be back again with you tomorrow at the same time. Tomorrow, I'll be speaking about the end purpose of marriage. What is it that is made possible through marriage and cannot be attained in any other way. The point that I made in my talk yesterday is that according to God's plan, marriage is a covenant based on the sacrifice made for us by Jesus on the cross. Through the death of Jesus on our behalf, each party to the marriage lays down his life for the other and then enters into a new life that is lived out through the other. The husband looks back at the cross and says, That death was my death. When I entered into this covenant, I died. Now I'm no longer living for myself. My life is in you. The wife looks back at the cross and she says the same. That death was my death. When I entered into this covenant with you, I died. Now I'm no longer living for myself. My life is in you. And that, I believe, is the only basis on which a marriage can truly succeed. The understanding that it's a covenant and that a covenant is entered into by each party laying down his life for the other and then finding a new life that is lived out through the other. As I said yesterday, this is contrary to modern thinking. The attitude of most people in our culture today is, what can I get? What's in this for me? But I believe there has to be a radical change of thinking for the man or the woman or the couple together who want to make their marriage succeed. Today I'm going to talk to you about the end purpose of marriage. What is it that is made possible through marriage and cannot be achieved in any other way? And as I talk to you, if you're married, I want you to be asking yourself, am I achieving that? Or am I missing the real purpose? To begin with, I want to read to you part of a conversation that Jesus had with some Pharisees about marriage. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. And some Pharisees came to him, testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? Now that was the teaching of some rabbis at that time. In other words, they were doing just what I said, God does not accept they were setting their own terms for the covenant of marriage but Jesus answered and said to them have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh consequently they are no more two but one flesh 
What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I want to show you two important points in Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. First of all, when Jesus taught about marriage, he went back to God's purpose at creation. He would not lower the standard to anything that had intervened in history from that time. He was faithful to his Father. He knew from the Scriptures, as all good Jews should know, the story of creation and how God had provided a mate, a helpmeet for Adam. And he said, that's the basis. God's original purpose is the only purpose that is acceptable in God's sight. And so, when we talk about marriage, as Christian believers, we have to do the same as Jesus did. We have to go back to the original purpose of God and see what that was. The second thing I want to point out is what that purpose was. It is that two shall become one. In other words, to sum it up in one word, it's union or unity. What I want to say to you is that unity is godlike. The ultimate, the original, the only perfect pattern of unity is found in the Godhead. The Father and the Son are one. Not one person, but one in union through the Holy Spirit. And in a certain sense, what God is aiming at in marriage is that a man and a woman will achieve this most godlike of all achievements, true union, true unity. But the way to it is the way that God has laid down. And there is no other way into the kind of union which God desires in marriage but God's way. The next truth that I have to bring to you follows immediately from what I've already said. The end purpose of marriage is union, and union in turn leads to knowing. This is a thought that it's possibly difficult for people in our culture to understand because we've got such an intellectual concept of what knowing is. But in the original language of Scripture, the word know had a much deeper meaning than merely knowing facts. In the book of Genesis, chapter 4, and verse 1, immediately after the description of man's fall and its consequences, the next chapter opens with this statement, Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now, the modern translations tend to use some phrase like, Adam had relations with his wife. Of course, that's correct in the sense that it describes what happens. But the King James Version actually is more faithful to the original text at this point, And it brings out that what God is aiming at is knowing. Of course, between a husband and a wife, that includes a sexual relationship. But merely to limit it to a sexual relationship is completely to miss the purpose of God. That's why... In a certain sense, I'd rather stay with the King James translation, Adam knew his wife. It was not merely sexual. Now, in the language of the Old Testament, there are two distinct phrases used. One says, a man knew a woman. The other says, a man lay with a woman. And the Bible is very discriminating as to how it uses those phrases. In my talk tomorrow, I'm going to explain the implication of the difference. But what I just want to impress upon you today is that the end purpose of God in marriage through union is that a man and a woman truly know one another. What's involved? The more I meditate on this, the more deep and wonderful it seems to me. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, Jesus speaks about the worth of a human soul. And he says, in effect, one human soul is worth more than the whole universe. Now, I believe that. I believe there is no way to measure the value of a single human soul. So what is it that happens in marriage? Marriage, as planned by God, opens the way for two human souls to know each other. To know each other to their innermost depths. 
in every area of their lives, physical, mental, emotional, cultural. It's the union of two persons, not just two bodies, nor just two minds. Some people put all the emphasis on sex, some put it all on the intellect. But in God's purpose, it's total, a total knowing by one person of another. I speak on the, from the background of a very happy marriage that lasted 30 years. And in my personal judgment, there is no greater privilege in life than to be permitted to know another person this way. The second point about God's provision of marriage is that by insisting on a covenant and commitment as the way into that marriage, he has provided protection from each party from being exploited or betrayed. Let me say frankly that any woman who allows herself to be sexually exploited by a man, to have sexual relationships with a man, without that man first making a covenant commitment, she is really prostituting her personality. I'm not just talking in terms of sexual morality, but I'm saying that in actual fact that woman is desecrating the most precious thing that she has, her personality. She's exposing her whole personality to someone who's not willing to pay the price that God requires. It's the same with a man. A man is doing the same when he has relations with a woman, but there's no commitment, there's no covenant. The purpose of marriage is this deep, ongoing, intimate, personal relationship protected by commitment. This relationship should be continually deeper and richer as the marriage continues. I look back on my own first marriage and I think that over 30 years Lydia and I were continually coming to know one another more deeply and more intimately. Our marriage grew richer and fuller the longer it lasted. There was never an anticlimax. I think sometimes we would sit and travel in the car together maybe an hour without speaking. And then when we'd both begin to speak simultaneously, we'd start talking about exactly the same thing. In other words, the relationship just didn't depend on verbal communion, nor did it depend merely on sexual relationship. But it was a total knowing of one person by another. Now my time has run out for today. I'll be back again with you tomorrow at the same time. And I'll be talking about counterfeits that cheat us, human substitutes for marriage that do not produce God results. Yesterday I spoke about the end purpose of marriage, union that leads to knowing. I explained that the end purpose of God in ordaining marriage is to allow two persons to know one another to the innermost depth of their total personality that it's not merely a physical relationship or a, an emotional one or an intellectual one, but it's two persons knowing each other in all their fullness. And I said also that human personality is the most precious and wonderful thing created in the universe. And so God has set very careful boundaries so that one person may know another but never exploit another. And those who ignore these boundaries and try to get the benefits without meeting the conditions, are deceiving themselves. They're being cheated. So today I'm going to speak about the opposite side of this theme. Counterfeits that cheat us. Human substitutes for marriage that do not produce God's results. First let me point out to you that people only counterfeit things that are valuable. And this applies to marriage. If it weren't so valuable, there'd be no counterfeits. When the Old Testament speaks about a man having sexual relationship with a woman, it uses two distinct phrases. Some places it says, the man knew the woman. In other places it says, the man lay with the woman. If you care to trace this, you'll see that there's a very careful distinction maintained. The Bible only says that a man knew a woman if the relationship was legitimate, if it was in line with God's ordinance for sexual relationship between a man and a woman, if it was based on a covenant commitment. But if a man merely had sexual relationship with a woman without making a covenant commitment to her, 
It does not say that the man knew the woman. It only says he lay with her. And I believe that this contains a deep truth, that God does not open the way for that kind of interpersonal relationship where one person truly knows another unless it is preceded by covenant commitment. There can be a physical relationship. There can be some kind of sexual pleasure. But the real purpose of marriage, the deep inner knowing of two persons, one of the other, is possible only on the basis of covenant commitment. Let me read to you what it says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers God will judge. I want to point out to you that that's a statement that cannot be challenged. God is going to judge fornicators and adulterers. Let me explain to you simply the difference in this context between fornication and adultery. Fornication is having sexual relationship without a covenant commitment. It's more or less promiscuous sex. But adultery is what happens when a person has made a covenant commitment in marriage and then breaks the commitment by having relationship with someone outside the marriage. Of the two sins, adultery is a greater sin than fornication because it's the breaking of that most sacred thing, a covenant. But in each case, the sin consists in the wrong attitude to covenant commitment. One is trying to get the relationship without the covenant commitment. The other is making a covenant commitment and then breaking it. I want you to understand that God's requirements are designed to protect us from being hurt. And any person who indulges in illegitimate sex is desecrating or violating his or her own personality. And the end of that, ultimately, is not satisfaction, it's not joy, it's not peace, it is frustration and hurt. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. I don't believe that merely means that a person who indulges in promiscuous sex is liable to get venereal disease, though that is one aspect. But I believe that a person who indulges in illegitimate sex is misusing and abusing his own body. And I believe our bodies protest against that misuse. And that there are results in our total personality which come from the abusing of the sexual relationship. We sometimes speak about people breaking God's laws. I want you to understand that that's not accurate. We never break God's laws. God's laws break us. This is true in the physical realm. Well, no one ever yet broke the law of gravity. A person can step out of a fourth floor window. What happens? They don't break the law of gravity. The law of gravity breaks them. And that's exactly how it is in this matter of sexual relationships. We don't break God's laws. God's laws break us. The essence of lust is using a human personality as a means, not appreciating the personality in itself, but simply exploiting it for some other purpose. Now, God never deals with human personality in this way. God always respects the personality that he himself created. I want to read you two vivid descriptions of what lust is and what it does. The first is taken from the Bible. The second will be taken from a well-known secular author. The Bible passage is in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 6 through 27, and I'm reading from the Living Bible. I was looking out the window of my house one day and saw a simple-minded lad, a young man lacking common sense, walking at twilight down the street to the house of this wayward girl, a prostitute. She approached him, saucy and pert, and dressed seductively. She was the brash, coarse type, seen often in the streets and markets, soliciting at every corner for men to be her lovers. She put her arms around him and kissed him, and with a saucy look she said, I've decided to forget our quarrel. I was just coming to look for you, and here you are. 
My bed is spread with lovely colored sheets of finest linen imported from Egypt, perfumed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come on, let's take our fill of love until morning, for my husband is away on a long trip. He has taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return for several days. So she seduced him with her pretty speech, her coaxing and her wheedling, until he yielded to her. He couldn't resist her flattery. He followed her as an ox going to the butcher, or as a stag that is trapped, waiting to be killed with an arrow through its heart. He was as a bird flying into a snare, not knowing the fate awaiting it there. Listen to me, young men, and not only listen, but obey. Don't let your desires get out of hand. Don't let yourself think about her. Don't go near her. Stay away from where she walks, lest she tempt you and seduce you. For she has been the ruin of multitudes. A vast host of men have been her victims. If you want to find the road to hell, look for her house. That's plain speaking, but it's the truth. Now you might say, well, that's religious. That's the way religious people think. But I want to read to you the words of another man, one of the greatest masters of the English language, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare was not, as far as we know, a religious man, but he was a master of descriptive language and a very accurate observer of human life. And this is what Shakespeare has to say in one of his sonnets on lust. I don't think anybody has ever described lust more vividly or accurately than this. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. And till action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner but despised straight, past reason hated as a swallowed bait, on purpose laid to make the taker mad, Mad in pursuit, and in possession so, Had, having, and in quest to have, extreme, A bliss in proof, but proved a very woe, Before a joy proposed, behind a dream. All this the world well knows, Yet none knows well to shun the heaven That leads men to this hell. Let me read you those last two lines again. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. What do you say about that kind of heaven that leads men to hell? My answer is it's a false heaven. It's a counterfeit. It's the devil's heaven and it leads you to destruction. How can you escape that hell? Shakespeare says none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Today I'm telling you how you can shun that heaven, that false heaven, the false heaven of deceptive lust. The answer is simple. Order your life according to God's laws. Accept what God says about the sanctity of the body, the sanctity of marriage. Let marriage be honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Don't sin against your own body by immorality. God is right. He tells us the truth. He sets these fences and boundaries to our conduct for our own good. We only rebel against them to our own destruction. Well, that's all for today. I'll be back again with you tomorrow at the same time. Tomorrow I'll be speaking about the roles of husband and wife in marriage, the special contribution that each party makes to the total relationship. In my previous talks, I have explained that according to God's plan or pattern, marriage is a covenant in which each party lays down his life for the other and then lives out a new life through the other. Yesterday, I dealt with the theme of counterfeits that cheat us, human substitutes that do not produce God's results. Today, I'm going to talk about the roles of husband and wife the special contribution that each party makes to the total relationship. Of course, I'm going to have to speak merely in brief outline, but I believe that it will be helpful. I'll begin with the role of the husband. As I see it in Scripture, 
A husband has three basic responsibilities toward his wife. First, to be a head. Second, to provide. And third, to protect. Let's talk first about the headship of the husband. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, The man, that is the husband, is the head of the woman, that is the wife. What does it mean to be a head? I would say that it implies ultimate responsibility for decision and direction. Obviously, the figure head is taken from the physical body. And in the physical body, as I understand it, the way God has ordered it, decision and direction come from the head. Through the nervous system and in other ways, all parts of the body can communicate with the head. And every part of the body has a legitimate right to communicate with the head. But the head is responsible for making decisions and deciding on directions. Now I believe that's the ultimate responsibility of the man to make decision and to decide on direction. And I believe in this area the initiative should be with the man. Let me speak to you very frankly and plainly for a moment. In the physical relationship, God has so ordered it that it cannot work unless the man takes the initiative. That's a simple fact of nature and physiology which cannot be changed. I believe that's a pattern of what God intends in every aspect of the relationship. The initiative should come from the man. Now let's talk about the husband as provider. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 Paul says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's very strong language to say that somebody is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the Christian faith. What kind of person is Paul speaking about? He's speaking about a man who doesn't provide for his wife and family. It's a sad fact, but there are quite a large number of people who are going about teaching the scriptures, preaching, and putting on what I would call a spiritual act. But when you go back to the root of it all, they haven't made proper provision for their own families. And the Bible says that's worse than being an unbeliever. Provision, of course, is primarily financial. We use the phrase, the breadwinner. It's a little out of date, but it's still applicable. However, I do not believe that a husband's provision for his wife is limited to finance. I believe that he's responsible for her total well-being, physical, emotional, social, and cultural. That he has to see that all her legitimate needs are met. Paul said in the passage we quoted earlier that the wife is the husband's glory. In other words, if you want to know how successful a man is, look at his wife. She's the evidence. And when a wife is fully provided for in every area of her life, physical, emotional, social, and cultural, she will indeed be her husband's glory. The third responsibility of the man is to protect in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says, You husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now that's one of the passages where the Bible goes contrary to most people's thinking. Because the attitude of natural man is, well, if someone is weak, you can dominate. You can get your way. You can force your way through. But the scripture says, just because a woman is weak, that's the reason not to dominate, but to honor. And uh, Peter says that husband and wife are heirs together of the grace of life, joint heirs. This is very significant, because in the legal system of the Bible day, when two people were joint heirs, neither of them could claim the inheritance apart from the other. Their claiming their inheritance depended on them operating together and moving together into their inheritance. This is true of husband and wife. There are many things in God's provision which a wife or a husband cannot claim on their own. It's only as they learn to flow together and to harmonize that the full provision of God is made available. 
So it's a husband's business to protect his wife, to stand between her and every pressure, every blow, everything that would break her down. And let me say to you husbands, the more you protect your wife, the more joy and satisfaction you receive in return from her. It pays husbands to invest in your wives. Turning now to the wife, what is her contribution to a successful marriage? In the first place in Scripture where God introduces the theme of marriage, in Genesis chapter 2, he describes what he intends the wife to be, a helpmeet, or in modern translations, a helper. I do believe that sums up in the one word the real purpose of God for the wife. It's to be her husband's helper. I suggest that there are two primary ways in which a wife can help her husband. The first is to uphold. The second is to encourage. How can a wife uphold her husband? Well, I think the easiest way to understand that is to picture the physical body. As we've said, the head is the directive, decision-making part of the body. And yet the head never holds itself up. The head is totally dependent on the rest of the body to be upheld and sustained and nourished. And there's one particular part of the body that is closest to the head and has the direct responsibility for upholding the head, that is, of course, the neck. And I suggest to you wives that, in a certain sense, you should picture yourself as the neck, the part that's immediately responsible for upholding your head, your husband. And if you find that just a little, maybe undignified, just bear in mind what somebody once said, that it's the neck which determines which way the head will turn. There's a lot of truth in that. Secondly, your next function, and it's very closely related, is to encourage. I can't tell you how important it is to a man to be able to look to his wife for encouragement. I can remember times in my past in my ministry, when I felt I was a failure. And a lot of other people felt I was a failure too. But I thank God that my first wife, Lydia, never in any way suggested to me that I was a failure. When I was down, she lifted me up. She encouraged me. I can remember one time I came to a point in early in my ministry when I felt I never wanted to preach again. I went to bed totally discouraged. I woke up next morning feeling fine, ready to go. My wife had spent the whole night in prayer for me. I cannot thank God enough for a wife like that. Now, wives, if you're going to encourage your husbands, there's a certain thing you'll have to practice, and it's called self-denial. Suppose you're sitting there feeling blue and mopey, dissatisfied, discontented with yourself, your husband, your home, your children, the car, but you know your husband's discouraged too. What are you going to do? Are you going to tell him just how bad you feel and just how blue you are and just how much you need encouragement and help? Not if you're a good wife. That's where you have to deny yourself. You have to suppress your own discouragement, your own negative emotions, and just devote yourself to encouraging your husband, to telling him what a fine husband he is, how much you love him, how much good he's doing you, just pick out everything you can that's good and, and focus on it, you say, well, that's asking a lot. Maybe, but I'll tell you something else, you'll get a lot out of it. Because in the last resort, you'll reap what you sow into your husband. So then those are the, are the responsibilities. The husband's responsibility, threefold. To be ahead, to provide, to protect. The wife's responsibility is summed up in the word to be a helper. And two primary ways of helping, to uphold and to encourage. Now, closing my talk today, let me just point out to you the two common basic failures of husband and wife. When a marriage fails, it's usually because either or both have failed in these ways. The common failure of the husband, one that's very common in our culture today, is to abdicate from his responsibilities. 
not to be the head. Sometimes this can be done in a very quiet, negative way that doesn't appear, but nevertheless, it's a failure. The wife's common failure is just corresponding. It's to usurp responsibility, to take over headship. And there's a great danger of a vicious circle where the husband continually abdicates and the wife continually takes over more and more responsibility. The only way that each can receive the needed grace is through the covenant commitment that God makes the basis of marriage. Now it's time to close. I trust my talks this week on the marriage relationship have helped you. I'll be back with you again next week at the same time, Monday through Friday. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at DPMUK Kingsfield Hadrian Way Baldock SG7 6AN.